Good afternoon, and welcome to today's talk, Europe Steps Out of the Crisis. Our speaker today is Dr. Ursula von der Leyen, the, the Federal Minister of Labor and Social Affairs of the Federal Republic of Germany. She's been a major figure in the ongoing Euro discussion, and, has been looking, and we've been looking forward to hearing her insights and on, this very, on this very important topic. Von der Leyen is a rising star in German politics. Just a couple of years ago, she was elected to Germany's parliament, the Bundestag, and currently serves as a member of Prime Minister Merkel's cabinet. During Merkel's first cabinet, <laughs> von der Leyen was the federal minister for family affairs, senior citizens, and women and youth. Her work on behalf of children and youth and on important work family issues and balance issues there have been well noted, not just in Germany, but around the world. Like many in the US, particularly women, Dr. von der Leyen got her start in politics at the municipal and state levels. By profession, she is a physician and also has a master's degree in public health. Now, if that's not enough to make you feel that you're not worthy, and I know that's how I'm feeling here, I should also add that she's the mother of seven children who range in age from 26 to 14. Please help me to welcome this very extraordinary woman, Dr. Ursula Van. such a great honor and pleasure to be here at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, and thank you especially, dear Dean, dear Professor Slaughter, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I wanted to talk about your steps, uh, your steps out of the crisis. I want to divide it in three different portions. At the very beginning, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, looking back where we did come from, where we do come from in Europe, just to give you a better understanding why things are as they are. Then I would like to speak about um, what the reasons for the Euro crisis were. And uh, at the very end, of course, the major part will be what are we doing at the moment being to step out of the crisis? What are the long-term consequences we're going to take? So just to have a look back, Europe, the Europeans for centuries waged war against each other. This was our history, basically. And I think you'll know that the darkest periods, period in uh, European history was the period of Nazi rule, was the period of World War II. And to understand Europeans and uh, Europe, the European Union, you must realize that at the very end, 60 years ago, at the end of World War II, it was Germany who had covered Europe with war and destruction and death and enormous suffering. At the end of this World War II, I think something, something amazing happened. Instead of marginalizing Germany, instead of dividing the European continent into winners and losers, which would have been natural after this disaster, Instead of doing this, the United States and the European allies did something very amazing. They did the opposite. They invested in reconciliation. And many times these days I think about wise men and women who decided not to divide this continent, but really to invest in peace, to invest in reconciliation. The symbol for this reconciliation for us was the so-called Marshall Plan. Because I mean, Europe was destroyed, Germany was destroyed. What did the United States? They did not take revenge. They just lent a helping hand to my parents' generation. And this is the origin of a deep gratitude and well, what I would call the German-American friendship. That's where the roots are. It made it possible for Germany at that point, 60 years ago, to rejoin the circle of democratic countries. And if you know that, you must keep in mind during this Euro crisis, we never forget where we did come from. This is very important to know that. For Europe, with this end of World War II and the beginning of the reconciliation, the beginning of a peace period, the last 60 years of peace in Europe were the longest period of peace the European continent has ever experienced. 
a process began that can be described, I think, as a great human success story. The European community developed into the European Union, and today we have 27 member states. That means 27 member states where you can travel free, you can study wherever you want to, you can work wherever you want to, free trade, basically, the common market, and what is most important, shared values. For example, shared values, what uh, the understanding of a common social security model is. And of course, as I said, 60 years of peace. So to begin, to, if I'm talking about the Euro crisis. Of course, Europe is more than a question of the Euro, a single currency, yes or no. It's way more, it's shared values. And it's a unique story of peace after a very dark period. Now let's have a look to the present situation. When we talk about the Euro crisis today, we have, of course, to ask what triggered the situation. 10 or 11 years ago, the European Union introduced in 17 member states one single currency, the Euro. And looking back, these 17 member states did not have the strength not only to introduce the common currency, but also what should have been necessary to have one single fiscal policy. Instead, they had a construction fault within the euro. They took the single currency and they said, we want to go on with 17 different fiscal policies, 17 different economic policies. So looking back, we know that this was one crucial mistake, one crucial fault in building up the eurozone, not to have, if you have one single currency, one fiscal policy, which would have meant for the 17 member states, of course, to give up fiscal sovereignty, sovereignty on the European level. What happened was that when we launched the single currency, of course, cheap money, one euro, flooded the countries. And of course, flooded countries like Greece or Portugal or Italy or Spain. And temptation was very high to increase sovereign debts, cheap money, <coughs> but not to increase competitiveness. This went on for quite a while, and at the very beginning, you've all seen the story, it led to an enormous economic boom in these countries. If we look at Spain, for example, um, there were a huge number of roads built that were not necessary. There was a huge construction boom. There were humongous infrastructure projects that never ever came to life. And of course, there was a huge number of new houses being built. People thought they could afford these houses because the low interest rates, money was cheap. And I think this sounds familiar to you, that uh, if you think at the housing bubble here in the United States, the mechanisms were certainly the same. So once again, the core problem was one single currency in 17 member states, a growing gap of competitiveness over the last 12 years between these states, public and private debts rising, because money was easy to get. And this whole scene, you have to put in the, um, you have to take in the background of this whole scene, that Europe is deep into demographic change, that is, Europe is an aging society, and Europe has a shrinking population. Now, 2010, we reached a breaking point, and the interesting part of the breaking point, or the final point, was set by the markets, by investors. It were the markets who said, we do not trust Europe anymore, the Eurozone specifically. We do not believe, believe that you will be able to pay back your debts. We do not believe that if we lend money, we'll get our money back. So all of a sudden you had skyrocketing interest rates, especially for the weaker countries, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy. 
and this was linked to growing unemployment. That's the story of where the crisis began. Now let me go to the focal point of uh, what we're going to talk about this afternoon. What are the steps out of the crisis? Today, two and a half years later, things are better than they were at the beginning of the crisis. You've all seen that Europe, especially, especially the Eurozone, had to do enormous reforms on fiscal policies. The genuine fiscal union is growing now. We do have real adjustments on fiscal consolidation. We have the so-called fiscal compact, which means that 17 different states have to stick to the rules of austerity, of debt ceilings, fiscal rules. And there are stricter rules for policy coordination. We are in the process of building a stronger banking sector. Capital has increased. Restructuration programs are in place. And we have institutional gaps that has been, have been closed. That's one part. This is just the fiscal part of the euro crisis. What I want to talk about today is more Let's have a look to the second side of this crisis, which is concerning not only the architecture of the euro, but is concerning the question, is Europe on the long term competitive? Will it be able to close the competitiveness gap we had between the south of Europe and the north of Europe? We have at the moment being of course because of the austerity, austerity measures. Quite a recession in the southern part of Europe. Look at Greece, look at Portugal, at Spain. So I want to talk about the five or six <coughs> different lessons we've learned over the last two, two and a half years. And Europe is working on right now to step out of the crisis. First of all, Europe is what employment is concerned, a continent which has, which has really a two-phase, is really a two-phase continent. In Germany, at the moment being, we have the lowest unemployment rate in 20 years. Same in Austria, same in the Netherlands. Unemployment is very low, 5% at the moment being. Even more, we have many branches that have an urgent need of skilled workers. At the moment, being in Germany, for example, we have one million open jobs that cannot be filled because there is nobody who is able and ready to take these jobs. On the other hand, if you look at southern Europe, there is mass unemployment. If you look at Spain and Greece, just to take these two examples, they have an average unemployment rate of 25%. And it's even way more dramatic if you look at youth unemployment. In Germany, youth unemployment is at an historical low, the lowest rate since reunification. If you look at Spain, if you look at Greece, you have 55% youth unemployment. If you look at Portugal and Italy, they have 35% youth unemployment. Even Sweden, 25%. Even France, 20% youth unemployment. This is real political dynamite, if you see that gap of youth employment in the European countries. And of course, young people ask for a perspective on the European continent. They cannot wait till the crisis is over. You can't tell them, wait five to 10 years, and then there will be employment, they want an answer now. So the first thing we've learned is Germany, one million open jobs, mass unemployment in the south. What Europe has to learn is to move to where the jobs are. We've looked at the U uh, figures of the United States. You are used to move to find a job. You have 2.8% of the total working age population that crosses a state border every year. 
Actually, you are the global leader for internal migration. In the European Union, you have a mobility rate of 0.18%, which is 15 times less. So, of course, the first mes message for Europe is, if there's a job in Germany, in Austria, in the Netherlands, if you are looking for a job and you live in Greece or Spain or Portugal, move, go get a job. I think this is a lesson Europe has to learn. It's a lesson you know, but for Europe, it's new. We've been talking earlier, of course, there's one barrier in Europe. We have free movement of worker, no problem. We have a language barrier, of course. So at the moment being, we invest a whole lot of money in uh, language classes. Because in Europe, you have 27 member states. You have 23 different languages, not to speak about the dialects. So you have to invest a lot of money in uh, language skills, but it, worth, it is worth it. Because the moment you've learned the second language, the third one is easier, and um, this is an ongoing process, so we invest a lot of money at the moment being, for example, in Spain, to teach young people the German language, to give them a chance to take a job in the country where they are desperately needed and welcome at the moment being. Second part, which is even more interesting, and it has a close link to the United States. I was talking about youth unemployment. There are huge structural differences in Europe. If you look at the countries that do have a low youth unemployment rate, all these countries have a strong pillar of vocational training. They have the school, they have, of course, college and university, as you know it. And in the middle, they have a strong pillar of vocational training. I remember 10 years ago, vocational training was something old-fashioned. And for those who weren't able to make it to college. 10 years ago, we had a high youth unemployment rate. And we had the pact with the economy to provide vocational training jobs. Vocational training today in Germany means 50% of young people are going into a vocational training. There are 340 different professions being taught, 340. You go in an enterprise, you get a hands-on training in the enterprise, you are being paid for your training, so you have a salary. You do not have to pay for your training, here you get a salary. And on one or two days during the week, you have theoretical training in a public school. I think the most important is at the end of your training, of two or three years, vocational training, you have a certificate that is acknowledged nationwide. So everybody knows what he or she is getting if, for example, you're looking for somebody who's been in the vocational training for mechatronics or plumber or whatever you might, a nurse, for example, whatever you might think about it. The second part which is important, the industry gets a custom-sized workforce. The industry gets exactly what they need because they create the vocational training jobs and they know what they need. So they have a highly skilled workforce, besides, of course, the academics, which is today the backbone of a very strong producing industry in the countries I just named, like, like Austria, like the Netherlands, like Germany. And uh, if you look at the southern countries where youth unemployment is very, very high, you see they have schools, and they have college or university. In between, there is nothing. And for me, it was interesting to hear my colleagues, the, the ministers for labor and social affairs, either from Sweden or from Spain, they said the problem is the industry hasn't understood in those countries that it's the responsibility of the industry and the employers to provide these vocational training jobs. It's not a question of politics or schools but it's the responsibility of the industry to provide these vocational training jobs so that you have the workforce, the skilled workforce. 
So at the moment, being one lesson to step out of the crisis for Europe is invest in vocational training. It's not only the one-way thing that Spanish young people come to Germany and take vocational training jobs, but we do a copy-paste thing and export the blueprint of how to build up vocational training to the south of Europe, knowing that it takes quite a while to establish it, but on the long term, this provides sustainable jobs we need desperately. Third lesson learned. Lesson learned. Um, I need where is uh, I need a slide up there. How bound? What? Where is she? There is one. Yeah, there is a slide. Here I see. Look at that step, slide. That's the big, big challenge coming especially up for Europe is the question of demographic change. On that slide, you see the proportion of population over age 60 right now. And the darker the country is, the higher is the proportion, of course, of people aged 60 years and older, over. The very dark countries, like you see Germany, you see Japan, there you have 30% of the population 60 years and older. Now, you might think it's a specific problem for example, of Germany, of Japan, and other countries. <coughs> Let's switch to the second slide that shows you the year 2050. That's how the world will be. There you see almost the total half of the north, the globe, the, part, the portion that is the north of the globe, will have a population that is 30% are older than 60 years. In other, word, in other words, the problems of demographic change will be the problems of almost all countries. It's just a matter of time till they will arrive to that stage. The key question is, the global key question is, who is the country who's going to tackle these problems the countries who will solve these problems first will be the world leader and change what demographic changes need to make. I'm going to leave that slide over there so that you have an idea what's coming up. That's a lesson, of course, that Europe has to learn because we're going to be the first ones. We are an aging continent. We have a shrinking population already. We know what demographic change is. So what are the two reasons for demographic change? The first one is a nice reason. We live longer. During my lifetime, we gained 10 years of life expectancy, 10 years during my lifetime, which is gorgeous. The question is, what have we done with these 10 years gained? And I think one more lesson Europe has to learn is we need a total mind change towards older workers. Because if you have an aging population, and we live longer, we have to work longer, but that requires a totally different attitude towards the older workers. We have believed for many, many years that older workers are slower, they're less innovative, they are less productive. We tend to look at older people from the deficit side. We know what they cannot do anymore. What we have to learn is to look at the things they can do. They can even do better than youngers may, uh, may be able to do. We have a very interesting research that we see that if you increase the ratio of older workers within your company, you can boost the workplace productivity. Why is, it, is this so? Because older workers have something which is very precious. They have a valuable professional experience to offer. If I put it in simple terms, life experience is something you cannot Google. <laughs> you either have life experience and you're an older person, or you don't have it. There's a wonderful story of Sviatoslav Richter, who was a um, piano player. And he, he gave concerts up to 80 years, 82, 83 years. He was 
um, giving concerts uh, as a piano player. And he was asked how he did this, being 80 years old. He said, I reduce my program, I focus on a few pieces, I train more, I practice more, and when I'm in a concert and there is a passage where I know I have to be very brilliant and very fast, right before this passage, I play a little bit slower <laughs> so that the difference is marked. <laughs> and people think I'm as brilliant as I was. <laughs> To put it in other words, I think on the long term, we've learned in, in companies with an aging workforce, the magic combination is take youngers with curiosity, coming fresh from the university, impatient, and mix it with older workers who know uh, where not to make a mistake, who have the experience, who know the business, who are um, a little bit more cautious, but they know what happens when you do mistakes. We have an old saying in Germany that says the younger ones might run faster, but the older ones know the shortcuts. <laughs> so I think that's something I want to learn about. Another thing we are doing a lot of research on in um, Germany at the moment, being having an aging workforce, is how can you improve lifelong learning and how can you improve age-appropriate workplaces? First of all, the lifelong learning thing is fascinating because it will be a revolution for education, for those who come from education. Education is very much focused on young people. And if you look at lifelong learning, we invest a lot of money in further education with people who are 35 to 45 years old. Afterwards, almost no investment. But it ha should be just the opposite. Um, I am a medical doctor by profession. When I studied medicine, I was taught that the brain um, will develop up to uh, till you're 20 years old, and afterwards you'll go, you'll you'll have um, a a um, the the brain will not develop anymore, but you will have a loss of cells year by year by year. Um, the good thing is. Today we know this is not so. We're speaking about, we're talking about brain plasticity. That is, the brain is changing and you can always learn, you see it in growing areas in the brain, as long as the incentive and the motivation are the right ones. So education will be a matter of how to find the right incentive for all the workers to go in lifelong learning this has to be a different one um, to incentives for younger people or middle-aged people. And for that, we have a nice story too. Um, one of the scientists in neuroscience told us, well, you know, if you have a 75-year-old and you want him to learn, or he wants to learn Japanese, for example, he should not go to school anymore. He should just fall in love with a Japanese lady and will be successful to learn Japanese. So that's the question of motivation, the question of incentive, where you really have to work on. My conclusion and my message with that slide is, I'm convinced the society, the economy, that is innovative in terms of age-appropriate production methods and further education will be the winner of demographic change. Next topic. Demographic change is not only we live longer, which is the nice part in it. Demographic change is also a question of there are too few children born. This is bitter. And this is something which does not have to be. This is no must. There's a specific long story about demographic change in Europe. And um, this story starts when 50, 60 years ago, in Europe at least, education aimed at the girls, which is a good thing. We had a long story of boys being better at school and um, girls lagging behind. Well, we were very successful, and I think the United States were very successful at this thing too. Today, 
it's not a question whether you're a boy or a girl, what access to education is concerned. It's just the other way around. At the moment, being girls are performing better at school, they're performing better in university. So the question we raise in Germany by now is what's wrong with the boys? Where's the problem with the boys in education? But that's another topic I will not deal with today. The weird thing is we invest a lot of education in girls and boys. And everything is okay as long as they do not have children. They have a huge career ahead of them. They have the world is open. Education gives you a lot of opportunities. In Europe, for a very long time, the message was, especially for women, you can do everything if you are well educated, but you will have a problem the moment a child is born. Then you have to decide. It's an either or thing. Either you have a career or you have children. And the bitter part is that this message was understood the last 40, 30, 20, 10 years in the European continent. Young women took a choice. They took the choice either to have a career or to have children, which is a huge loss on both sides. You, lo you lose a lot of capital, what education and um, uh, skills are concerned. And of course, you have many, many families who would have had children if things would have been easier. On top comes a very fierce debate, especially if you look at the southern countries, Germany included, about who is the good mom. The focus is always on the woman. Is it the mom at home? How do you have to care for the children? And what about my career? Well, if you take the OECD countries, you see a very interesting development. Those highly industrialized countries and highly educated countries that uh, have a better reconciliation of work and family, in other words, that do not put a conflict in either kids or career, but they signal you can have a career and you can have kids both at the same time, those societies do have more children because the perspective is better. So children in Korea are not a conflicting goal. That's a story that these countries have to learn. And if you look at countries in Europe, you see that the French population, the Scandinavian population, there is a very small problem only on um, demographic change. They have a higher birth rate because reconciliation of work and family is good. Not only that, these countries, especially the, the Scandinavian countries, develop a very strong role model for active fathers. So the care thing is something you share between women and men. And I'm focusing on that because if you look at that thing, this is not only a story of not having children, it's also a story about who is going to care for the elderly. Perhaps not everybody has children. But everybody has parents. And these parents are going to get old. So who's going to care? These questions, whether you develop these questions concerning children or concerning the elderly, the answer is always the same with a shrinking middle generation. You only will manage this if you share the burden of care or the opportunity to care and you share the possibility to have a career and to earn an income. Well, I've been talking about a lot of things like youth unemployment or employment rates, where Germany, vocational training for example, is always first in class. If you look at Europe, at the moment being the question of reconciliation of work and family, a question of having a perspective, or the question of bosses and babies, women and men, is something where Germany has to catch up desperately. And where, for example, the Scandinavian or the northern countries, France, Scandinavian countries, are way better. In other words, one lesson on top for Europe to learn is, although we have very different competitiveness, if you look on the long term, to the problems we will have to tackle, we will have to learn from each other. Not, there's not one country being first in class. 
but we have different strengths and deficits. Last point. Um, Europe steps out of the crisis with demographic change during the last economic crisis, uh, starting with uh, Lehman Brothers in 2008. We learned something about how to react to a dramatic drop in uh, production demand. And we took another way than it's typically on the globe. Normally, if the um, goods producing industry, for example, drops as it was in the crisis, and there is no work to do anymore, you go down to release the workforce. It's a question of hire and fire. In Germany, we had another reaction. Because the, the skilled workforce is shrinking, there was a joint action of policymakers, of employers, and of trade unions to say, let's keep the skilled personnel in the work, in the enterprises. We called it Kurzarbeit, which is short term time work. We introduced short time work, although there was no work to do because there were no real projects. And uh, we found a consensus to say, the employers will carry the overhead costs to keep the workforce in the enterprises, which cost them five billion, actually. The workforce is ready to waive a percentage of their wages, which was a loss of three billion. And policy or politics are willing to pay for the wages for those in the enterprise who have no work to do, which was a sum of five billion Two. In summary, what happened compared to other countries? The employees stayed in the enterprises, in the companies. We kept our business specific knowledge in the companies, the well trained experts in the companies. And the moment the global demand picked up again, Germany was ready to go. We could take the bid, we could offer to take the demand because we have the experienced personnel in the enterprises and we had vacancies, we, had, uh, we were able to invest in these offers. So produ production could ramp up immediately without any delay. And looking back, we've seen that within this Lehman Brothers crisis, the crucial factor was speedy reaction, time. Those societies who reacted rapidly to the crisis came out better and stronger out of the crisis than other societies who reacted slowly and had the economy going down um, by firing people and releasing the workforce and not picking up as rapidly at the end of the crisis. Finally lesson, final lesson learned. You know that Europe is strong on social security systems. And uh, I know there's a strong prejudice that social security does cost a lot of money. Sure, it's expensive. For us, it was very interesting to see during the crisis that the, fin the financial and economic crisis, that the social security systems all of a sudden turned out to be automatic stabilizing systems. What happened? As I told you, the production dropped dramatically in Germany too. We had a drop of 80% of production in the producing industry. We had this in other countries too. But in Germany, the social security system had the function of an automatic stabilizer because retirement payments went on. Unemployment payments went on. Short time work payments went on as if nothing have, had happened. So we had this weird situation that the newspapers were full of writing about the crisis, but crisis, the crisis didn't reach out to people's life. They didn't experience unemployment. They didn't experience pension payments cut, cuts like in other countries. 
So domestic consumption stayed up during the crisis. And this, this made it much more easier for the industry in Germany to keep up at least at a lower level, but domestic consumption stayed up. I was very pleased to hear your President Obama during his inauguration saying, I cite, the commitments we make to each other through social security do not sap our initiative. They strengthen us. They do not make us a nation of takers. They free us to take the risks that make this country great. Um, I finished the citation. It sounds very familiar for European ears. Because this is something we really learned about social security systems. And as I know you're in the middle of debate about social security systems, I think it's worth to have a, worth to have a look at uh, how social security systems on the long term um, influence also the domestic demand and uh, a society. So to finish, um, the Euro Pride crisis is not over yet. Of course. I think we went halfway in restructuring the Euro architecture, fiscal policies. We are in the middle of learning what we have to do on the long term to have competitiveness all over Europe, that we have sustainable growth, that we have an increase in jobs in the south of Europe. We've learned that one currency needs one fiscal policy. We've learned that you have, or we will have to learn, that you have to move to find a job. I think we're in the process of learning that to fight youth unemployment, you need to have a sound vocational training. We are in the process to learn, look at the slide, that age isn't only about loss, but it's a lot about gain. We are in the uh, process to learn that um, a winning society combines kids and careers. And I think that social security pays off and is not a burden. So these are the lessons Europe is learning at the moment being. Thank you for sharing the attention. <laughs>
whether it's boys or girls. The question is, um, how much mobility will you have with the workers? We have, in the moment, at the moment being, a process specifically in uh, Germany to learn that you need, do you desperately need qualified migration. <coughs> um, we had a long history of migration in Germany, but it was a low-skilled migration. So now we're changing the policy of looking for qualified migration. I know the whole world is uh, competing, competing <laughs> around um, qualified migrants, <coughs> engineers, doctors, for example, just to name some. But these are steps forward that occur right now in uh, the European uh, economies, and these are new to Europe. Europe is not the continent who willingly accepted um, qualified migration, or migration, any kind of migration. Europe is more traditional and reluctant to have migration. So we see right now that we have to open up and really get in contact with these countries. And for me, it's interesting that I have many countries, for example, Asian countries, for example, um, with China, with the Philippines, with Vietnam, with India, where I see societies that are desperately looking for opportunities um, to have uh, um, uh, education circulation, migration, which is based on, on, on uh, education, skills, research, and things like that. And I think this is a huge opportunity for the old continent to learn a lot. It's also a huge opportunity to get links between the, the, the countries I just named, which haven't been there before. So this certainly will be uh, something which will change in the European continent. It has to, because of a shrinking workforce. Thank you, Minister, for your points. My name is Roberto Pitea. I'm a master's student here at the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'm Italian. Um, I agree with the picture you painted, um, and it strikes me because it made me realize that we, as our generation of Southern Europeans, Italians, Spaniards, Greeks, are both the most educated generation, but the one that faces less opportunities than their parents did before. And so as our grandparents left to work in the mines and the factories in Germany and Belgium, my generation leaves to become engineers and entrepreneurs in Germany, Brazil, North America. And that poses the question, well, if all the 33% youth that is unemployed in Italy leaves, our society ages faster and our human capital is depleted. So we kind of cheat ourselves out of a way to have a renaissance that our region needs. So my question for you is, how do you think Southern Europe could achieve a renaissance by using, and if they could just use austerity alone to achieve that renaissance? Well, austerity alone will not help us. I was in Italy um, quite a few times during the last year, and it's fascinating to see. Italy is like Europe in a nutshell, because you have the northern part of Italy, it's enormous. It's a, a really strong industry, a strong producing industry. It's almost like, like Switzerland or like the southern part of Germany, so very similar. And then you have the southern part of Italy. I don't have to tell you, you know it. <laughs> it's totally different. Um, so you really see, in a nutshell, Italy is the picture of Europe. The second thing in Italy is very interesting. Um, it's a country, and I know that from Germany too, which is very traditional about roles of men and women. So you have a strong topic on uh, reconciliation or non-reconciliation of work and family, and of course a rapid decline in birth rate. And um, so at the moment being, Italy has tough times. You, have, you need austerity measures because the interest rates are rising. Um, you need to show that you are tackling the sovereign debts, the deficit. On the other hand, which is tough for the population, you do and you need reforms on the labor market. So for the normal populations, it's very hard to understand why all these austerity measures and these reforms uh, come over them, although they haven't really, uh, they are not uh, the reason for the crisis at all the normal population. And um, you have, as I've seen in Italy, um, a real problem with youth unemployment too. The thing we're doing at the moment being with the Italian government is exchange knowledge about, as I said, youth unemployment. The good part is 
We are picking companies in the south of Italy, asking them, are you willing to establish vocational training jobs? We're going to supply the theoretical training as a government. We're going to invest money in Italy so you can build up this. <coughs> um, at the very end of this process, or let me put one thing even more. Italy is doing well at the moment. We have a lot of respect what you're going through. On the long-term, confidence will only come back to Europe and also to Italy if we stick to this very sensible politics. So you have elections coming up. <laughs> <laughs> and we just cross fingers. <laughs> because, I mean, it was fascinating to see that the, 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 the investors uh, the, the global investors just didn't trust politics in Italy anymore, that politics were able to do the reforms that were necessary. And then with Monti, because he restored confidence in politics in Italy, um, he did better. It's not the solution of the long term only to restore confidence. You, of course, you have to do reforms. But in Italy, you could see how important it is that you have a system where investors can rely on if they invest in Italy right now. In 10 or 15 or 20 years, they are going to get their money back. Otherwise, they won't invest. Last thing for you. Um, I was talking to Elsa Corneo. She's the, the Minister for Labor at the moment being in Italy. And we were talking about exchange vocational training. And at the very end, I asked her, isn't it hard for you if we ask to gather young people in Italy, why don't you apply for jobs in Germany? Because you're welcome, we need you. You know, it's a matter of brain drain. And then she said what I really respected. She said, well, no, it's our duty as politicians here in Italy to improve things so that this country is so attractive that these young people will come back again. And I think this is a very noble attitude um, to see that at the moment being, you cannot <coughs> keep young people unemployed in Italy just to keep them in Italy. They need a perspective. And if it's not Germany, it's Canada, it's all, all Australia, it's, I mean, it's the United States, it's all over the world. They will go and they have to go because they need a future. And I like very much this attitude to say we have the responsibility in politics to restore this country, to make it better so that people come back again. Minister, thank you very, very much for this inspirational uh, lecture. Um, I'm Harold James. I teach here in the Wilson School. Um, in your introductory remarks, you emphasized under common European values the commitment to social security systems. You came back to that at the end of your lecture, uh, I think rightly. You emphasized that social security systems were an automatic stabilizer. And it, it seems to me that there was an implication, but I wondered whether you would like to draw that out, that in terms of completing the European labor market, in terms of making for rates of labor mobility, that are closer to those in the United States. Europe clearly <coughs> can't solve the linguistic problem, but it could get a common social security system. It could Europeanize social security. You would then get automatic transfers between the different regions. They would occur to and from individuals rather than to and from states, and in that sense be more politically acceptable. And it seems to me that this would be, if you're thinking of a long-term solution to the crisis, one of the ways out of the European malaise. I wondered whether you'd thought about this, particularly in light of your response to the previous question, because one of the things that's only just happened in Italy is that they've introduced a common social security system for the whole country. It's very difficult with, with a big north-south division in terms of income, but you can do it, and if you can do it in Italy, can you not do this in Europe? Thank you. It's a very good question. And um, the short answer is yes in the long term. 
uh, the longer answer is the problem at the moment being with the euro, we've gone the way of a growing gap of competitiveness. So if you want to resolve your problems, you first have to improve competitiveness in those countries who really have a problem. And they do have to do reforms, a lot of reforms. Before you do not do this, you cannot harmonize, for example, the social security system because then you go into the trap again of cheap money, which is cheap transfers, fiscal transfers, without the pressure of having the reforms that are needed. I would put it the other way around. We would have never ever have had these reforms of the fiscal union um, in the Eurozone without the pressure of the markets. So if the crisis wouldn't have occurred, we would not have moved a centimeter because it, no, no na nation, no member states likes it to give up sovereignty on the European level. <coughs> but we were forced by the crisis because investors did not invest any more in Europe as long as we did not solve this fiscal problem. Um, to do reforms, uh, nobody would have done deliberately. And now the second step is to understand that the euro also led to this, this, this growing gap of competitiveness. And therefore, the reforms, in specifically southern Europe, but also France, of course, as the Swedish minister told me, CD2, have to be done first. Then the second step, of course, I think on the long term, the answer is yes. Um, I'm part of the very, very small fraction <laughs> in Europe who thinks on the very long term we should have the United States of Europe. But if you say this in Europe, everybody goes nuts. <laughs> so um, this is a very long term perspective. And of course in the long term then you will have um, a fiscal policy on a European level. We will have of course harmonized social security system. But you have to do one step up. Thank you, Dr. My name is Lucas Keller. I'm a student at uh, the University of Constance in Germany and now currently at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, my question relates to the issue you raised um, regarding um, increasing labor mobility within Europe as a means to come out of the crisis. Um, you've raised this point earlier that this basically consists of two components. One is increasing um, incentives for workers to move abroad and uh, to seek job, uh, jobs in other countries. Uh, the other part is increasing um, or putting in place policies that increase um, the, an attitude that is, that is welcoming towards immigrants, qualified immigrants. Um, in Europe, th this, this welcoming, uh, well, I mean, the. The, the approach to immigration is much more assimilationist, let's say. It's, it's, it's um, um, less flexible and progressive than in the US. So what can policy makers do? What can be policy instruments to increase the, um, the readiness of European societies to accept great amounts of You're qualified right. Traditionally, uh, the European migration policy is um, not welcoming at all. Um, so what can policy do? First of all, we, we changed the rules, we changed the law, we introduced a so-called blue card, which um, makes clear that the rules within Europe are the same for qualified workers. You need, for example, an annual income of 33,000 if you have, if you're an engineer or a medical doctor, then you have free access uh, to Germany to take whatever job you want to take as a medical doctor or an engineer in the, those, um, those professions who uh, are really, um, where we desperately need skilled workers. Um, so you have to change the law, but what is even as important is to change communication about it. You need a political elite who speaks positively about qualified migration. I kept telling my population over the last two, three years that qualified migration creates jobs in Germany. The fear is always that migration, any kind of migration, takes jobs away from the domestic population. And I kept telling them, if you have, a, for example, a medical doctor who's not there, an engineer, um, the, 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 the job for an engineer who's not filled, well, then the secretary doesn't have a job. 
Um, the cleaning lady doesn't have a job. The technician doesn't have a job. The nurse doesn't have a job. So these are jobs, domestic jobs, that could not be filled because we do not have the doctor or we do not have the engineer who can t either make the operation or take the project and then um, bring work to Germany. So it's better we have somebody from abroad filling the job than not having this job filled at all. In other words, the attitude must be if we don't care where somebody comes from. We care what he or she is able to do, what their profession is, whether they want this to bring this country forward. And uh, the interesting part is that if you look at the polls, the attitude towards qualified migration changes, gets positive. By now the population has understood, well, it's better to have qualified migration than to have uh, open jobs that are not filled. And uh, so it's not only the laws, it's also communication a lot. So I think we have time for these last two questions. Um, thank you, Minister, for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Hanna. I'm a student at Princeton University. Uh, during your speech and in one of the other questions, you touched upon the idea of austerity and debt ceiling limits. And I thought it was interesting that you prefaced your speech with the Marshall Plan. And later on in the speech, you talked about how Germany was able to weather the crisis by um, having its industry and its government create like kind of a buffer zone between the effects of the crisis and its own workers. Um, my question is, considering that, um, what level, if any, of austerity is necessary for the other countries? And if it is, why is their situation different from the German situation? And if possible, could you comment on how our country has been making the path to recovery and how you see uh, what path we should or have been taking? Well, when the Euro crisis started, um, it was basically all, the, 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 it was very hard to make understood that we have a debt, sovereign debt problem. <laughs> this was not acknowledged at the very beginning. And uh, a sovereign debt prob problem means you need austerity measures. Either you have enormous growth, economic growth, but you need structural reforms. And uh, therefore, at the very beginning, these austerity measures were necessary because um, in those country who did, countries who did well, you saw that structural reforms have uh, been taken or done years ago. But those countries who really had a problem um, didn't have any structural reforms over the last five to 10 years. So these austerity measures were necessary to restore a financial, financial system that is reliable and sustainable, sustainable on the long term. But of course, the discussion in Europe was, um, is it enough to have austerity measures? No, is the answer, of course, it's not enough. We need a lot of investment in uh, economic growth. And, um, but this investment has to be, if you just throw money into the economy, this won't be long lasting. You need an investment in uh, structures that are sustainable on the long term, otherwise you will not succeed. And that's the problem we're tackling right now. For example, we are thinking about um, putting Europe to work by thinking about loans to small and medium enterprises for a reasonable interest rate in countries that are vulnerable if they are willing to provide vocational training jobs. So it's difficult at the moment being, for example, in Spain or in uh, Portugal or Greece for small and medium enterprises to get reasonable credits, loans, um, for a reasonable interest rate. You might provide this, but they have to provide also vocational training jobs. And these are thoughts to invest in growth, but linked to um, systems where we know on the long term we will be successful. Thank you very much for a very delightful presentation. I'd like to make um, three very brief points. <coughs> Number one, a question. How long uh, does the, do the unemployment benefits continue in Germany under the social system as compared to the uh, uh, rather shortened episodic system that we have here. 
this point. Uh, number two, in my experience as a professional scientist working in Europe, in Switzerland, and then in going throughout Germany, um, the key to communication aside from the German that I knew, was um, the fact that most every professional spoke English. And I would humbly suggest that if English were broadly, more broadly, more broadly uh, taught, you would have yet greater mobility because you have a common language. Yes, and, right. okay. and um, the most important in item number three, I'd really like to deal in some length with the austerity issue. Um, if if one, for example, looks at the um, Reinhardt and Rogoff book, Miss Time is Different, there's a long discussion of how many bank and sovereign failures occur throughout or have occurred throughout the world over the last, whatever it was, 800 years. And as you know, they're very frequent. Um, the austerity program seems to be a clear rejection of Keynesian economics. It's not that one cannot impose or demand changes such as um, vocational education. But it's not clear to me at all why that has to be done with a stick rather than a carrot. With a stick rather than a? I'm sorry? With, with a carrot. carrot. Oh, with, with a carrot. carrot. Yes, <laughs> a carrot. <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, um, well, let, let's, let's start with the last thing. I know this is an ongoing discussion between Europe and the United States. Whether um, the difference to the United States, for example, you have the federal bank, you have one fiscal policy, uh, you have one president. If this president says something, it's meaningful for the whole United States, for 50 states. Who is the president of Europe who says something meaningful for 27 member states? Is it Barroso? Is it Draghi? Is it Hollande? Is it Merkel? Is it Rajoy? Is it Monti? <laughs> so you see the problem of not having one United States of Europe, just to put it in these terms. Um, and therefore, uh, once again, uh, the United States it's easier for the United States to add to the federal bank what uh, money supply is concerned and how much, you, how much you invest in your country at the moment. As the European structures are different, I just told you about who is Mr. or Mrs. President in Europe. Um, you cannot do that. And the other thing is we really had huge discrepancy what the state of the governments, the, 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 the different member states were concerned. For example, I don't want to blame Greece, but uh, you have, for example, in, in certain professions, absolutely close shop in Greece, taxi driver. There was a limited number of licenses given to that for, for taxi drivers, and then you had a monopoly. Um, nobody else could access this profession. So one of the structural reforms was, just an example, to say, wait a moment, competition is whoever wants to be a taxi driver can be a taxi driver if he is able to drive a car and have the license, all that stuff. But you are able to compete um, because there's a lot of tourism in this country. And I, yes, I've been in New York. There's so many taxis. <laughs> just imagine this in Greece, for example. Well, this is, for example, um, something about competition possibilities, yes or no. The minimum wage in Greece is, Greece is higher than minimum wages were in countries like Germany, for example, in certain branches. So as the minimum wage is so high, almost nobody was working legally anymore, but you have a huge black market for labor. I'm telling you this example, <coughs> only, uh, or the taxing system in Greece, there was no existing regular taxing system. There are many very, very, very wealthy Greeks, but certainly not paying taxes in Greece. And therefore, talking about carrot and stick, 
it was a painful process to be open and frankly about there have to be reforms to be done, whether you like it or not. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee with huge sums on the European level that we will sustain <coughs> your economy. And um, of course, this was certainly not a carrot given. It was more the stick you're right. But I think this, this um, learning process that we have to be open about the difficulties and the problems we have in the different economies. And I was frank about the problems Germany is facing with uh, the whole female workforce and all these things, for example. Um, we have to be open to be honest on where the problem lies and then to do reforms. And in a structure, the European structure, where you do not have one homogeneous language, a homogeneous discussion, and a homogeneous um, federal government who leads a discussion, it's much more difficult um, to have a communication about necessary reforms or not. Because the open thing in uh, Europe, it's the others who want to mix into our affairs instead of having a very open discussion. Um, so, I think we've learned the lesson that austerity alone will not save us, but we go deep into recession. So we are in the process right now to investing in economic growth, but it has to be on, we have to choose the right instruments. Your second question was the language, of course, I mean, um, please tell 27 heads of states and governments <laughs> to switch to English. <laughs> I'd love it. As a second language, yeah, this is okay. This, I'm with you. <laughs> this is okay. Uh, we, tr we do our best. Uh, we always try our English on you then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, if you want to interact on the global um, uh, labor market, you basically need to speak English. So, uh, and I think on the long term, the common European language will be English too, because by now it's the, the language on, in which we communicate in Europe if we don't find um, the same language. For example, with my French colleagues, I love to speak French, but um, uh, I had the, the Spanish colleague. She wasn't speaking German, I, I'm, I'm not speaking Spanish, so of course we communicate in English. This is always the language we take when we do not speak the other language. And finally, the social security system. What was your question? I forgot. How long, how long did you provide coverage? Oh, yes. I do not know the, exactly the, 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 the months in the, the United States, but in Germany, for 12 months, you have an unemployment payment, which is 67% of your former wage, uh, one year. But afterwards, you're going down to another stage with is, which is an unemployment payment which is at a low level, but it's ongoing as long as you have no job. It is relatively low, it's the minimum you need for existence, but uh, you have housing, you have heating, you have, of course, uh, you have the, the, the minimum you need to live on. Um, what is combined with these payments is uh, the, the need or you have to take a work that is offered to you if there is work available or training, um, training place. So if you do not do this, of course, you can uh, take the uh, welfare allowance away. But basically, it's forever because we are convinced you cannot just let people be without shelter and food and uh, um, uh, something to live on. Healthcare coverage is universal. Um, and pension payments are based on a pay-as-you-go system combined with a capital-funded uh, system. This sounds very positive right now. We've done many, many, many reforms in these social security systems. People did not like neither to have them stable and um, specifically stable what demographic change is concerned. So um, to be permanently restructuring um, the social security system is something we're used to and we will have to do this on the long term. 
But the basic idea is everybody should have health care, access to health care. Everybody should have a welfare payment if she or he is not working and able to earn an income. And of course, you have retirement payments um, which you earned during your lifetime or when you have no retirement payments at all, you have this minimum income that is provided by the state. <laughs> so, so thank you.